anyway, so I'm going to be struggling over pronunciation for a lot of things. So the pronunciation may not be correct every time. So you'll just have to deal with that. And then I'm reading because I think this is a great way to start the year. So we're starting off the year reading a book and dedicated to the divine feminine. What a way to start, right? Now, I actually had started reading this. Um, I started reading this a few times. And then every time I start, I'm like, oh, no, I should be sharing this with people. It shouldn't be just me. So then I put the book down. So I'll be rereading things. And even in my rereading, I already know how difficult it's going to be to actually pronounce this stuff. So just go with it. I'm reading it just to really set the energy of the year. So this is a ritual, if you will. And I don't know how long it'll take me. It's a thin book but you just don't know because they'll be struggling over stuff. So this is to set the energy of the year. Enjoy, sit back, relax. You know, maybe put your, this is what you do before you go to sleep or something. Just listen to this. I don't know. Here we go. So it starts off with, it says, Meditation of Mahakali. I resort to Mahakali, who has 10 faces, 10 legs, and holds in her hands the sword, disc, mace, arrows, bow, club, spear, missile, human head, and conch, who is three-eyed, adorned with adorn ornaments on all her limbs, and luminous like a blue jewel, and who Brahma extolled in order to destroy Madhu and Kaitaba when Vishnu was in mystic sleep. And since we've been talking about a decade, let's go with that whole 10 thing, 10 situation. I think this is perfect. So now we begin verse one, and I'm just going to read until I feel it's time for me to stop. <laughs> Mark and Dea said to his disciple, Krasustuki Baguri, Saverni, son of Surya, is called the eighth Manu. Listen while I describe in detail about his birth, how Savarni, illustrious son of Surya, became the lord of the eighth Manvantara, by the grace of Maha Maya. Okay, and there are also going to be things that explain to you some of the stuff that they just said. So I'm going to read all that to you. So Savarni was so called because he was the son of Savarna, Surya's wife. He became King Saratha and the second Maha Manvantara. One cycle creation is divided into 14 manvantadas. The period ruled over by one manu is called a manvantada. They are therefore 14 manus as follows. Svayambhuva, Svaroksisa, Rokisa, Utama, Tamasa, Raivata, Kaksusa, Vaivasvata, Savarni, Daksha Savarni, Brahma Savarni, Dharma Savarni, Rudra Savarni, Deva Savarni, and Indra Savarni. And then Maha Maya is one of the names of the Divine Mother. In former times, there was a king named Suratha, born of the Kaitra dynasty, ruling over the whole world in the period of Svarosisa. He protected his subjects duly like his own children. At that time, the kings, who were the destroyers of the Kolas, became his enemies. He, the wielder of powerful weapons, fought a battle with the destroyers of Kolas, but was defeated by them, though they were a small force. Then he returned to his own city and ruled over his own country. Then that illustrious king was attacked by those powerful enemies. Kaitra is said to be the first son of Swarasiza, and that's the dynasty that he was ruling over. And the word Kola Vida Vamisina is variously explained by the commentators. Pardita explains the word enemies in alliance with the Kolas. Kolas may refer to the aboriginal race of Kolas, whose descendants are even now living in some parts of India. Okay. Even in his own city, the king, now bereft of strength, was robbed of his treasury and army by his own powerful, vicious, and evil-disposed ministers. Thereafter, deprived of his sovereignty, the king left alone on horseback for a dense forest under the pretext of hunting. He saw there the hermitage of Medas, the supreme among the twice-born. 
inhabited by wild animals which were peaceful and graced by the disciples of the sage. Entertained by the sage, Siratha spent some time moving about in the hermitage of the great sage. Then, there then, overcome with attachment, he fell into the thought, I do not know whether the capital, which was well guarded by my ancestors and recently deserted by me, is being guarded righteously or not by my servants of evil conduct. I do not know what enjoyments my chief elephant, heroic, always elated, and now fallen into the hands of my foes, will get. Those who were my constant followers and received favor, riches, and food from me now certainly pay homage to other kings. The treasure which I gathered with great care will be squandered by those constant spendthrifts who are addicted to improper expenditures. The king was continually thinking of these and other things. Near the hermitage of the Brahmana, he saw a merchant and asked him, Ho, who are you? What is the reason for your coming here? Wherefore do you appear as if afflicted with grief and, de and depressed in mind? Hearing the speech of the king uttered in a friendly spirit, the merchant bowed respectfully and replied to the king. The merchant said, I am a merchant named Samadhi. Born in a wealthy family, I have been cast out by my sons and wife, who are wicked through greed of wealth. My wife and sons have misappropriated my riches and made me devoid of wealth. Cast out by my true kinsmen, I have come to the forest grief-stricken. Dwelling here, I do not know anything as regards good or bad of my sons, kinsmen, and wife. At present, it's welfare or ill luck theirs at home. How are they? Are my sons living good or evil lives? The king said, why is your mind affectionately attached to those covet covetous folk, your sons, wife, and others who have deprived you of your wealth? The merchant said, this very thought has occurred to me just as you have uttered it. What can I do? My mind does not become hard. It bears deep affection to those very persons who have driven me out in their greed for wealth, abandoning love for a father and attachment to one's master and kinsman. I do not comprehend, although I know it, O noble-hearted king, how is it that the mind is prone to love even towards worthless kinsmen? On account of them, I heave heavy sighs and feel dejected. What can I do since my mind does not become hard toward those unloving ones? Markandeya said, Then, O Brahmana, the merchant Samadhi, and the noble king together approached the sage, Medas. And after observing the etiquette worthy of him, and as was proper, they sat down and conversed with him on some topics. The king said, Sir, I wish to ask you one thing. Be pleased to reply to it. Without the control of my in intellect, my mind is afflicted with sorrow. Though I have lost the kingdom like an ignorant man, though I know it, I have an attachment to all the paraphernalia of my kingdom. How is this, O best of sages? And this merchant has been disowned by his children, wife, and servants, and forsaken by his own people. Still, he is inordinately affectionate towards them. Thus both he and I, drawn by attachment towards objects whose defects we do know, are exceedingly unhappy. unhappy. How, does this, how this happens then, sir, that though we are aware of it, this delusion comes, this delusion besets me as well as him, blinded as we are in respect of discrimination. The Rishi said, sir, every being has the knowledge of objects perceivable by the senses. An object of sense reaches it in various ways. Some beings are blind by day and others are blind by night. Some beings have equal sight both, day, both by day and night. Human beings are certainly endowed with knowledge, but they are not the only beings to be so endowed. It is by the light of discrimination we know the proper nature of things in real and unreal. For cattle, birds, animals, and other creations also cognize objects of senses. The knowledge that men have, birds and beasts too have, and what they have, men also possess. And the rest, like eating and sleeping, is common to both of them. 
Look at these birds, which though they possess knowledge and are themselves distressed by hunger, are yet, because of the delusion, engaged in dropping grains into the beaks of their young ones. Human beings are, O oh, tiger among men, attached to their children because of greed for return help. Do you not see this? Even so men are hurled into the whirlpool of attachment, the pit of delusion, through the power of Mahamaya, the great illusion, what makes the existence of the world possible. Marvel not at this. This Mahamaya is the Yoga Nidra of Vishnu, the Lord of the world. It is by her the world is deluded. Verily she, the Bhagavati, Mahamaya, forcibly drawn the minds of even the wise, throws them into delusion. She creates this entire universe, both moving and unmoving. It is she who, when propitious, becomes a boon giver to human beings for their final liberation. She is the supreme knowledge, the cause of final liberation and eternal. She is the cause of the bondage of transmigration and the sovereign of over all lords. The king said, Venerable Sir, who is that Devi whom you call Mahamaya? How did she come? Incomparable. Hold on, sorry. How did she come into being? And what is her sphere of action, O Brahmana? What constitutes her nature? What is her form? Wherefore did she originate? All that I wish to hear from you, O you supreme among the knowers of Brahman. The Rishi said, she is eternal, embodied as the universe. By her, all this is pervaded. Nevertheless, she incarnates in, man, in manifold ways. Hear it from me. When she manifests herself in order to accomplish the purposes of the devas, she is said to be born in the world, though she is eternal. At the end of a kalpa, when the universe was one ocean, with the waters of the deluge and the adorable Lord Vishnu stretched out on Sesa and took, um, took to mystic slumber, two terrible asuras, the well-known Madhu and Kataiba, sprung into being from the dirt of Vishnu's ears, sought to slay Brahma. Brahma, the father of beings, was sitting in that the lotus that came out from Vishnu's navel. Seeing these two fierce asuras and Jana. Janardara asleep, and with the view awakening Hari, Brahma, with concentrated mind, extolled Yoga Nidra, dwelling in Hari's eyes. The resplendent Lord Brahma extolled the incomparable goddess of Vishnu, Yoga Nidra, the queen of cosmos, the supporter of the worlds, the cause of sustenation and dissolution alike of the universe. Brahma said, you are Svaha and Svada. You are verily the Vasatkara and embodiment of Svada. You are the nectar, O eternal and imperishable one. You are the embodiment of the threefold matra. You are half of matra, though eternal. You verily, you are verily that which cannot be uttered specifically. You are Savitri, the supreme mother of the devas. Now I'm gonna define all of this for you. <laughs> One second. So Yoga Nidra is the tamastic power of Hadi. Okay. So when you see Yoga Nidra, it's a tamastic power of Hadi. So the power and the statement where you see Yoga Nidra, it says, seeing the two fierce asuras, and the asuras are kind of like spirits, Janadharna asleep, and with the view to awakening Hadi, Brahma with con concentrated mind extolled Yoga Nidra. Okay. So extolled a power dwelling in Hadi's eyes, okay? So pralaya or deluge overtakes the world at the end of an eye, at the end of an eon. When the rain and rising water submerge the whole earth, the unified undifferentiated water to which everything is reduced signifies primordial cause. And that is um, in the reference to saying she's eternal, when she manifests herself in order to accomplish the purpose of the devas, she is said to be born into the world, though she is eternal. At the end of a kalpa, when the universe was one ocean with the waters of the deluge, and that's the description of that. Then Ananta, Lord of servants who supports the earth, is the Lord's couch. And you see that reference. 
Where do you see that reference? When he says that the adorable Lord Vishnu stretched out on the sesa, took a mystic slumber. So that is um, the Lord's couch, Anatta, Lord of the Serpents. Okay, and then more here. <laughs> you are Svaha. Svaha is the proprietary mantra the devas uttered when a oblation is poured in the fire for them. So it's almost like when we say something, ashe, ashe. Um, so that's what Svaha is. And then you are Svada. And that is the propriety mantra of the mains, the pitas, uttered when offerings are made in ceremonies in honor of, de of departed ancestors. So that's what you say when you're working with ancestors. So deity, Svaha, Svada. So to say you are the Svaha, you are Svada, you are everything. And then Vasatakada in the text signifies Yajna or Vedic sacrifice. And then Devi is herself, the sacrifice and the heaven to be attained through the performance. Um, and that is the Svara. <laughs> you are the nectar. And the nectar is the Suda, the food of the Devas, signifies immortality. Therefore, threefold Matra, which is the Omkara, which makes up Aum. You are, so essentially, you are everything. You are half a Metra, though eternal. The famous Savatri hymn, which occurs in the Rig Veda. Okay. You are the Savitri and the Supreme Mother of the Devas. So pretty much, this is a description of the Divine Mother. You're everything. You're the beginning, you're the end, you're the sacrifice, you're not the, you're, you're everything. Okay. So now let me continue on. I think I got everything. Oh, and then Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas, of all which are things of which all things are composed. And then um, all powers of good and evil belong to her. Powers of good are hers as much as power, powers of evil, all right? So that's where we say, you are the primordial cause of everything, bringing into the force of the three qualities. And the three qualities are Safa, Raja, and Tamas. You are the dark night. So we continue. You are, oh, the great Devi, also the greatest Suri. You are the dark night of periodic dissolution. You are the great night of final dissolution and the terrible night of delusion. You are the goddess of good fortune, the ruler, modesty, intelligence, characterized by knowledge, bashfulness, nourishment, contentment, tranquility, and forbearance. Armed with sword, spear, club, discus, conch, bows, arrows, slings, and iron, iron mace, you are terrible, and at the same time, you are pleasing, yea, more pleasing than all the pleasing things, and exceedingly beautiful. You are indeed the supreme Isfadi, beyond the high and low. She is compassionate to those who surrender to her, but terrible to those who disobey and go against her. And whatever or wherever... And I must say this, that oftentimes the subconscious mind is described just as that. Just got to throw that out there. And whatever and wherever a thing exists, conscient, conscient real, or non-conscient, unreal, whatever power all that possesses is yourself. Oh, you who are the soul of everything, how can I extol you more than this? By you, even he who creates, sustains, and devours the world is put to sleep. Who is here capable of extolling you? Who is capable of praising you? Who have made all of us, Vishnu, myself, and Shiva, take our embodied forms? O Devi, being lauded thus, bewitch these two unassailable suras, Madhu and Kataiba, with your superior powers. Let Vishnu, the master of the world, be quickly awakened from sleep and rouse up his nature to slay these two great asuras. The Rishi said, there, the Devi of delusion, extolled thus by Brahma, the creator, in order to awaken Vishnu for the destruction of Madhu and Kataiba, drew herself out from his eyes, mouth, nostrils, arms, heart, and breast, and appeared in the sight of Brahma, an unscrutable birth. Janardana, Lord of the universe, quitted by her, rose up from his couch and on the universal ocean and saw the, those two evil suras, Madhu and Kataiba, of exceeding heroism and power, with eyes red in anger and endeavoring to devour Brahma. Thereupon, all-pervading Bhagavan Vishnu got up and fought with 
the Asuras for 5,000 years, using his own arms as weapons, and they, frenzied with their exceeding power and deluded by Mahamaya, exclaimed to Vishnu, Ask a boon from us. Bhagavan, or Vishnu, said, If you are satisfied with me, you must both be slain by me now. What need is there of any other boon? My choice is this much needed. The Rishi said, those two Asuras, thus bewitched by Mahamaya, gazing then at the entire world turned into water, told Bhagavan, the lotus-eyed one, slay us at the spot where the earth is not flooded with water. The Rishi said, saying, be it so, Bhagavan Vishnu, the great wielder of the conch, discuss mace, took them on his loins, and there severed their heads with his discus. Thus she, Mahamaya, herself appeared when praised by Brahma. Now listen again, the glory of this Devi, I will tell you. So here ends the first chapter called The Slaying of Madhu and Kaitaba of the Devi Mahatmaya and the Markandeya Purana during the period of Svarni, the Manu. So Let's see what it says. As the whole universe was flooded, the demons thought the Lord would not be able to find a waterless spot to kill them. As, however, the deluge water had not come up to the lords of the loins of the Lord, he took them up there and killed them. And then let's see if it's anything else. So, so it's there the Devi of Delusion, extolled by this Brahma, the creator, in order to awaken Vishnu for the destruction of Madhu. And Kataba drew herself out from his eyes, mouth, nostrils, arms, and breasts, and appeared in the sight of Brahma of inscrutable birth. And so according to the three gunas of nature, Mahamaya takes three forms, Mahakali, Mahalakshmi, and Mahasaraswati being her tamaska, rajasika, and sattvasika forms. So the different three energies that combine everything. All right. Let's continue to read. That was one chapter. So this, that was all about Mahakali. So now we go to Mahalakshmi. So when you think about these deities, we kind of know their stories, but this is actually where it was written. Right, we hear them when you go online and everything, but th this is the story of how you, how it comes to be who these goddesses or this triple goddess is. Okay, okay. I resort to Mahalakshmi, the destroyer of Mah Mahiasura, who is seated on the lotus, is the is of the complexion of coral and who holds in her eighteen hands. Rosary, axe, mace, arrow, thunderbolt, lotus, bow, pitcher, rod, shakti, sword, shield, conch, bell, wine cup, trident, noose, and the discus, sudarsana. The tree said, of yore, when, the, when Mahi Asura was the lord of Asuras and Indra the lord of Devas, there was a war between the Devas and Asuras for a full hundred years. In that, the army of the Devas was vanquished by the Valorous Asuras. After conquering all the Devas, Maha Asura became the Lord of Heaven, Indra. Then the vanquished Devas, headed by Brahma, the Lord of Beings, went into the place where Shiva and Vishnu were. The Devas described to them in detail, as it happened, the story of their defeat wrought by Mahas, Mahi Asura. He, Mahasura himself, was assumed the jurisdictions of Surya, Indra, Agni, Vayu, Khandra, Yama, Varuna, and other devas. Thrown out from heaven by that evil-natured Mahisa, the hosts of devas wandered on earth like mortals. All that has been done by the enemy of the devas has been related to you both, and we have sought shelter under you both. May both of you be pleased to think out the means of his destruction." Having thus heard the words of the devas, Vishnu was angry and also Shiva, and their faces became fierce with frowns. They issued forth a great light from the face of Vishnu, 
who was full of intense anger, and from that of Rama and Shiva too. From the bodies of Indra and other devas also sprang forth a very great light, and all this light united together. The devas saw their concentration of light like a mountain blazing excessively, pervading all the quarters with its flames. Then that unique light produced from the bodies of all the devas pervading the three worlds with its luster combined into one and became a female form. By that which was Shiva's light, her face came into being. By Yama's, by Yama's light, her hair, and by Vishnu's light, her arms, and by Kandra's light, her two breasts. By Indra's light, her waist, by Varuna's light, her shanks and thighs, and by Earth's light, her hips. By Brahma's light, her feet came into being, by Surya's light, her toes, by Vasu's light, her fingers, by Kubera's light, her nose, by Prajapati's light, her teeth came into being, and similarly, by Agni's light, her three eyes formed. The light of the two sun. Sandhyas became her eyebrows, the light of Vayu, her ears, and the manifestation of the lights of other devas to contribute to the being auspicious, being the auspicious Devi. And then um, yeah, this is Appa, Durva, Soma, Dada, Anila, Anala, and Pratsya and Prabhasa are the eight Vasus. Then looking at her, who had come into being from the assembled lights of all the devas, the immortals who were oppressed by Mahayasura experienced joy. The bearer of Pinaka, Shiva, drawing forth a trident from his own trident, presented it to her. And Vishnu bringing forth a discus out of his own discus gave her. Varuna gave her a conch, Agni, a spear, and Maruta gave a bow as well as two quivers full of arrows. Indra, Lord of Devas, bringing forth a thunderbolt out of his own thunderbolt and a bell from which that of his elephant Adavata gave her. Yama gave a staff from his own staff of the death in Kandika. The auspicious Kandika said to Kali these playful words, because you have brought me both Kanda and Munda, you, O Devi, shall be famed in the world by the name Kamunda. So essentially, <laughs> so funny, these funny, 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 funny deities. What's happened here is that Kali comes out, okay, as Maha Saraswati, also, also known as, um, and this is, situation Kandika. They have all kinds of names, but you know which ones they are. There's, there's Kandika, there is, um, uh, what else? What else is another one? Of course, the Devi. So when you see, when you hear the Devi, Kandika, and then Ambika is another one, I think. Those are typically the same thing. It's the Deva, it's the Deva Mahat. Um, it's the great mother, the divine mother, sorry, and the different ways of expressing um, herself, okay? All right, all right. Now, where we left off was, so one of the great Asuras, now Asuras is pretty much kind of like a demon, if you will, um, saw Maha Saraswati and was like, yo, she's fine, and I want her to be mine. Now, we already, the, the previous chapters, we already found out what Lakshmi was about, and we already found out what Mahakali is about. So essentially, they're nothing to mess with. But this dude was like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm about to get it. So, all right. She just, he sent out his, like, two strong, um, two strong, like, warrior people, and Kali came out and tore him to shreds. So now here we go <laughs> after this. And and the Kandika laughed and said, ha, 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 you shall be famed in the world by the name Kamunda. <laughs> Put their names together. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right. <clears throat> the Rishi said, after the Daita, Kanda was slain and Munda was laid low and many of the uh, many of the battalions were destroyed. The Lord of Asuras, powerful Sumba, with mind overcome by anger, commanded then the mobilization of all the Daita hosts. Now let the 86 Asuras, upraising their weapons with all their forces and the 84 Kambus, surrounded by their own forces, go out. Kambu is a family of Asuras. 
let the 50 Asura families of Kotiviras and the 100 families of Damur, Damur Mudras go forth at my command. Let the Asuras, Kalakas, Dardas, the Marias, the Kalakias hasten at my command and march forth ready for battle. After issuing these orders, Sumba, the lord of the Asuras and ferocious leader, went forth, attended many thousands of big forces. Seeing that most terrible army coming, Kandika filled into space between the earth and the sky with the twang of her bowstring. Kotivira, the Daimura, this is um, descendants of family of Asuras. Okay. Thereon, her lion made an exceedingly loud roar. O king, and Ambika magnified those roars with the clanging of her bell. Kali, expanding her mouth wide and filling the quarters with the sound, hum, overwhelmed the noises of her bowstring, lion, and bell by her terrific roars. On hearing that roar, the enraged Asura battalion surrounded the lion, the Devi, Kandika, and Kali on all four sides. At this moment, O king, in order to annihilate the enemies of devas and for the well-being of the supreme devas, there issued forth, endowed with exceeding vigor and strength, shaktis from the bodies of Brahma, Shiva, Guha, Vishnu, Indra, and with the form of these devas went to Kandika. Whatever was the form, oh, it's, like the, it's like the Care Bear stare. Whatever was the form of each deva and whatever his ornaments and vehicle in that very form, his, his shakti advanced to fight with the Asuras. In a heavenly chariot drawn by swans advanced Brahma's Shakti carrying a rosary and Kamandula. She is called Brahmani. Shaktis are the embodied forms of powers of the respective devas. Mahasvati arrived seated on a bull holding a fine trident wearing bracelets of great snakes and adorned with the digit of the moon, Ambika Kamari in the form of Guha, holding a spear in, right, in hand, riding on a fine peacock, advanced to the Asuras. Likewise, likewise the Shakti of, Mish, of Vishnu came, seated upon Garuda, holding conch, club, bow, and sword in hand, the Shakti of Hari, who assumed the incoming incomparable form of a sacrificial boar, she also advanced there in boar-like form. Narasimha arrived there, assuming a body that of a Narasimha, bringing down the constellations by the toes of her mane. And, that's, and Narasimha is the Shakti of Vishnu in his incarnation as a man-lion. And then Shakti of Indra is the Lord of Gods. All right, and that comes soon. Likewise, the thousand-eyed Andri, which is the Shakti of, uh, of Indra, holding a thunderbolt in hand and riding on the Lord of Elephants, arrived just like Sakra. Then Shiva, surrounded by those Shaktis of the Devas, said to Kandika, let the Asuras be killed forthwith by you for my gratification. Thereupon, the, for the from the body of Devi issued forth the Shakti of Kandika, most terrific, exceedingly fierce, and yelling like a hundred jackals. And that invincible Shakti told Shiva of dark-colored matted locks. Go, my lord, as an ambassador to the presence of Sumba and Insumba. Tell the two haughty Asuras, Sumba and Nsumba, and the other Asuras assembled there for battle. Let Indra obtain the three worlds and let the Devas enjoy the sacrificial oblations. You go to the netherworld if you wish to live. But if you, but if through pride of strength you are anxious for battle, come on then. Let my jackals be satiated with your flesh. Like, look, look, go hide. But if not... Come with it. All right. Because that Devi appointed Shiva himself as ambassador, thenceforth she became renowned in this world as Shiva Duti. Those great Asuras, on their part, hearing the words of the Devi communicated by Shiva, were filled with indignation and went to Katiyani and went to where Katiyani stood. Then in the very beginning, the enraged foes of the devas poured in the front of the Devi showers of arrows, javelins, and spears. And lightly, with the huge arrow shot from her full-drawn bow, she clove those arrows, spears, darts, and axes hurled by them. All right. 
Then, in front of him, Sumba stalked Kali, Kali, pierced the enemies to peace with her spear and crushing them with her skull top staff. And Brahmani, who, wherever she moved, made the enemies bereft of valor and prowess by sprinkling, sprinkling on them the water from her Kamindalu. The very wrathful Mahasvari slew the Daitas with her trident and Vaisnavi with her discus and Kamari with her javelin, torn to pieces by the thunderbolt which come down upon them, hurled by Andri Daitas and Danavas fell on the earth in hundreds, streams of blood flowing out of them, shattered by the boar-formed goddess Varahi, with blows from of her snout, wounded in their chest by the point of their of her tusk, and tore her tore by her discus, the Ashuras fell down. Narasimhi, filling all the quarters and the sky with her roars, roamed about in the battle, devouring all the great Ashuras torn by her claws, demoralized by the violent slaughter of the Shiva Duti. The Ashuras fell down on the earth. She then devoured them who had fallen down, seeing the enraged band of martyrs crushing the great Ashuras, thus by various means, the troops of the enemy enemies of Devas took to their heels. Seeing the Ashuras harassed by the band of martyrs and fleeing, the great Ashura Rakta Bija stood forward to fight in wrath. Whenever from his body there fell to the ground a drop of blood, at that moment rose up from the earth rose up from the earth Ashura of his stature. The great Ashura fought with Indra Shakti with club in hand. Then Andri also struck Rakta Bija with her thunderbolt. Blood flowed quickly and profusely from him who was wounded by the thunderbolt. From the blood rose up fresh combatants in his of his form and valor. As many drops of blood fell from his body, so many persons came into being with his courage, strength, and valor. And those persons also sprung up from his blood, fought there with the martyrs in a more dreadful manner, hurling from the very formidable weapons. And again, when his head was wounded by the fall of her thunderbolt, his blood flowed and therefore were born persons in thousands. Vasnavi struck up with her discus in battle. Andri beat the Lord of Asuras with her club. The world was pervaded by thousands of great Asuras who were of his stature and who rose up from the blood that flowed from him when cloven by the discus of Vasnavi. Kumari struck the great Ashura Rakta Bija with her spear, Varaji with her sword, Mahasvati with her trident, and Rakta Bija, the great Ashura too, filled with wrath, struck every one of the martyrs severely with his club. From the stream of the blood which fell on the earth from him, and when he received multiple wounds by the spears, darts, and other weapons, hundreds of Ashuras came into being, and those Ashuras were born from the blood of Rakta Bija, pervaded the whole world. The Devas got intensely alarmed alarmed at this. Seeing the devas dejected, Kandika laughed and said to Kali, O oh, Kamunda, open out your mouth wide, and with this mouth quickly take in the drops of the blood generated by the blow of my weapon. Also, the greatest shore is born of the drops of blood of Rakta Bija. Roam about in the battlefield, devouring the greatest shores that spring from him. So shall this Daita with his blood empty perish. Oh, man. As you go on devouring these, other fierce assurers will not be born. Having enjoined her thus, the Devi next smote him, Rakta Bija, with her dart. Then Kali drank Rakta Bija's blood with her mouth, and then there he struck Kandika with his club. The blow of his club caused her not caused her not even the slightest pain, and from his stricken body, wherever the blow flowed copiously, there Kamunda swallowed it with her mouth. The Kamunda devoured those great Ashuras who sprang up from the flow of blood in her mouth and drank his blood. In rage at seeing his great army slaughtered, Insumba then rushed forward with the chief of forces of the Ashuras in front of him, behind him, and on both sides of him, great Ashuras enraged at and biting their lips advanced to slay the Devi. Sumba also, mighty in valor, went forward surrounded with his own troops to slay Kandika in his rage after fighting with the martyrs. Then commenced severe combat between the Devi and on one side, on one side and on the other, Sumba and Sumba, who like two 
thunder clouds rained a most tempestuous shower of arrows on her. Kandika, with numerous arrows, quickly split the arrows shot by the two Asuras and smote the two lords of Asuras on their limbs with her mass of weapons. And Sumba grasped a sharp sword and shining shield, struck the lion, the great carrier of Devi, on the head. When the carrier was struck, the Devi quickly cut and Sumba's super sword with a sharp edged arrow and also his shield on which eight moons were figured. When his shield was split and his sword too broken, the Ashura hurled his spear, and that missile also, as it advanced toward her, was split by her discus. Ooh. This is the kind of book I could have been raised on. Then the Danava and Sumba, swelling with wrath, seized the dart, and that also, as it came, the Devi powdered with a blow of her fist. Then brandishing his club, he flung it against Kandika, cleft by the trident of the Devi. It also turned to ashes. Then the Devi assailed the heroic Danava, advancing with battle axe in hand, and laid him low on the ground. When his brother Nsumba of terrific prowess fell to the ground, Sumba got infuriated in the extreme and strode forward to slay Ambika. Standing in his chariot and grasping excellent weapons in his long, incomparable eight arms, he shone by pervading the entire sky. Seeing him approaching, the Devi blew her conch and made a twang of her bowstring, which was unbearable to th in the extreme. And the Devi filled all directions with the ringing of her bell, which destroyed the strength of all Daita hosts. The lion filled the heaven, the earth, and the ten quarters of the sky with loud roars, which made the elephants give up their violent rut. Then Kali, springing upwards in the sky, came down and struck the earth with both her hands. By its noise, all the previous sounds were drowned. Shiva Duti made a loud, ominous peal of laughter. The Asuras were frightened by those sounds, and Sumba, and Sumba flew out, flew into an utmost rage. As Ambika said, O oh, evil natured one, stop, stop. When the devastation in the sky cheered her with the words, Be victorious. The, the sphere, flaming most terribly and shining like a mass of fire, which Sumba approached, hurled which Shumba approaching hurled was, as it was coming along, put out by a great firebrand from the Devi. The interspace between the two three worlds was pervaded by Sumba's lion-like roar, by the dreadful thunderclap of the Devi smothered that, O King. The Devi split the arrows shot by Sumba, and Sumba also split the arrows discharged by her, each with her and his sharp arrows in hundreds and thousands. Then Kandika became angry and smote him with the trident. Wounded therewith, he fainted and fell to the ground. Then Sumba, regaining consciousness, seized his bow and struck with arrows the Devi and Kali and the lion. And the Danuja Lord, the Lord of Ditti, putting forth a myriad of arms, covered Kandika with myriad dis discuses. Then Bhagavati Durga, the destroyer of difficulties and afflictions, became angry and split those discuses, discuses and those arrows with her own arrows. Thereupon, Nsumba, surrounded by the Daita hosts, swiftly seizing his club, rushed at Kandika to slay her. As he was just rushing at her, Kandika clove his club with her sharp edged sword and he took hold of a dart as in Sumba, the afflictor of the devas was advancing with the dart in hand kandika pierced him in the heart with the swiftly hurled dart from his and Sumba's heart that was pierced by the dart issued forth another person of great strength and valor exclaiming at the devi stop then the devi laughing out loud severed the head of him who issued forth with her with her sword. Thereupon he fell onto the ground. The lion then devoured those Asuras whose necks had crushed with his fierce teeth, and Kali and Shiva Duti devoured others. Some great Asuras perished, being pierced through, through by the spear of Kamadi. Others were repulsed by the sprinkling of the water purified by the incantation of Brahmani. Others fell, pierced by the trident wield by Mahasvati. Some were powdered on the ground by the blows from the snout of Arahi. Some Danavas were cut to pieces by the discus of Vaisnavi, and others again by the thunderbolt discharged from the palm of Aindri. Some Ashuras perished themselves. Some fled from the great battle. Others were devoured by Kali, Shiva Duti, and the, uh, and the lion. 
Here ends the ninth chapter called The Slaying of Nsumba. The Rishi said, seeing his brother Nsumba slain, who was dear to him as his life, and his army being slaughtered, Sumba angrily said, O oh, Durga, who are puffed up with the pride of strength, don't show your pride here. Though you are exceedingly haughty, you, restoring to the strength of others, fight. The Devi said, I'm all alone in the world here. Who else is there beside me? See, O oh, vile one, these goddesses who are but my own powers entering into my own self. Then all of those Brahmani, the rest were absorbed into the body of the Devi. Ambika alone then remained. The Devi, oh, this, is all, this is like turning, this is exciting. The Devi said, the numerous forms which I project by my own power here, those who have been withdrawn by me and now I stand alone, be steadfast in combat. The Rishi said, then began a dreadful battle between them both, the Devi and Sumba, while all the devas, assure, devas and Ashuras looked on. With the showers of arrows, with the sharp weapons and frightful missiles, both engaged again in a combat that frightened all the worlds. Then the Lord of Daitas broke the divine missiles, which Ambika discharged in hundreds with weapons that repulsed them. With fierce shout, with a fierce shout of whom and the like of Paras, Misfadi playfully broke the excellent missiles that he discharged. Then the Asura covered the Devi with hundreds of arrows, and the Devi in wrath split his bow with her arrows. And when the bow was split, the Lord of the Daitas took up his spear. With a discus, the Devi split that spear also in its hand in his hand. The next supreme monarch of the Daitas, taking his sword bright like the sun and shining shield, bearing the images of a hundred moons, rushed at the Devi at that moment. Just as he was rushing forward, Kandika split his sword with sharp arrows shot from her bow and also his shield as bright as the solar rays. With his steeds slain, his bow broken, without a charioteer, the Daita then grasped his terrible mace, being ready to kill Ambika. With sharp arrows, she split the mace of the Sumba, who was rushing at her. Even then, raising his fist, he rushed swiftly at her. The Daita Lord brought his fist down on the heart of the Devi, and the Devi also with her palm smote him on his chest. The Daita King, wounded by the blow of her palm, fell on the earth, but immediately he rose up again. Seizing the Devi, he sprang up and mounted on the hot on high into the sky. There also Kandika, without any support, fought with him. Then the Daita, Sumba, and Kandika fought as never before with each other in the sky in a close contact, which wrought surprise to the Siddhas and sages, a class of divine beings. And Bika then, after carrying on a close fight for a long time with him, lifted him up, whirled him around, and flung him down to earth. Flung thus, the evil nature Sumba, reaching the earth and raising his fist, hastily rushed forward, desiring to kill Kandika. Seeing that lord of all the Daita folk approaching, the Devi, piercing him on the chest with a dart, threw him down on the earth. Pierced by the pointed dart of the Devi, he fell lifeless on the ground, shaking the entire earth with its seas, islands, and mountains. When that evil nature of Sur was slain, the universe became happy, regained perfect peace, and the sky grew clear. Flaming portent clouds that were in evidence before became tranquil, and the rivers kept within their cor courses when Sumba was stricken down there. When he had been slain, the minds of all the bands of Davis became overjoyed, and the Gandharva sang sweetly, Divine Minstrels. Others sounded their instruments, and the bands of nymphs danced. Likewise, favorable winds blew. The sun became very brilliant. The sacred fires blazed peacefully, and tranquil became the strange sounds that had risen in different quarters. Here ends the tenth chapter called The Slaying of Sumba. The Rishi said, when the great lord of the Asuras was slain there by the Devi, Indra, and other Devas led by Agni, with their object fulfilled and their cheerful faces illumining the quarters, praised her, Katyayani, O Devi, who, you who remove the sufferings of your sub suppliants, be gracious, be propitious, O mother of the whole world, be gracious, O mother of the 
universe. Protect the universe. You are, O Devi, the ruler of all that is moving and unmoving. And then the Katyana, there's a there's a eulogy of this hymn in the Lakshmi Tantra. Lakshmi tells Indra the wonderful results of chanting it. Okay, just letting you know. You are the sole substratum of the world. You because you subsist in the form of the earth. By you who exists in the shape of the water, all this universe is gratified, O Devi, of inviolable valor. You are the power of Vishnu, have endless valor. You are the primeval Maya, which is the source of the universe. By you, all this universe has been thrown into an illusion, O Devi. If you become gracious, you become the cause of final emancipation in this world. All lores are your aspects, O Devi. So are all women in the world, endowed with various attributes. By you alone, the mother, the world is filled. What praise can there be for you who are of the nature of primary and secondary expression regarding objects worthy of praise? When you have been lauded as the embodiment of all beings, the Devi, the effulgent one, the bestower of the enjoyment and liberation, what words, however excellent, can praise you? Salutation be to you, O Devi Narayani, O you who abide as intelligence in the hearts of all creatures and bestow enjoyment and liberation. Salutation be to you, O Narayani, O you who in the form of minutes, moments, and other divisions of time bring about change in things and have thus the power to destroy the universe. Salutation be to you, O Narayani, O you who are the good of all good, O auspicious Devi, who accomplish every object, the giver of refuge, O three-eyed Gauri. Salutation be to you, O Narayani, you who have the power of creation, sustenation, and destruction, and are eternal. You are the substratum and the embodiment of the three gunas. Salutation be to you, O Narayani, O you who are intent on saving the dejected in distress that take refuge under you, O you Devi, who remove the sufferings of all. Salutation be to you, O Narayani, O you who ride in the heavenly chariot yoked with swans and assume the form of Brahmani, O Devi, who sprinkle water with kusa grass. Salutation be to you, O Narayani, O who bear the trident, the moon, and the serpent, and the ride a big bull, and have the form of Mahaswati. Salutation be to you, O Narayani, O you who are attended by peacock and cock, and bear a great spear. O you who are sinless, and take the form of Kuma Kamari, swan, um, oh. This is his book. Salutation be to you, O Narayani, O you who hold the greatest weapons of conch, discus, club, and bow, and take the form of Vasnavi. Be gracious. Salutation be to you, O Narayani, O you who grasp a huge formidable discus and uplift the earth with thy tusk, O auspicious Devi, who has a boar like form. Salutation be to you, O Nar Nar uh, Narayani. O you who in the fierce form of a man lion put forth your efforts to slay the Daitas, O you who possess the benevolence of saving the three worlds, salutation be to you, O Narayani. You who have a diadem and a great thunderbolt are dazzling with a thousand eyes and took away the life of Virta, O, and, o Andri. Sal salutation be to you, O Narayani, O who... O you who in the form of Shiva Dutti slew the mighty hosts of the Daitas, O you of terrible form and loud throat, salutation be to you, O Narayani, O you who have a face terrible with tusk and are adorned with a garland of heads, Kamunda, a Kamunda, O slayer of Munda, salutation be to you, O Narayani, O you who are good fortune, modesty, great wisdom, faith, nourishment, and spada, O you who are immovable, Immovable, O you, great night and great illusion. Salutation be to you, O Narayani, O you who are, who are intelligent and Saraswati, O best one, prosperity, consort of Vishnu, dark one, nature, be propitious, O queen of all, you who exist in the form of all and possess every might, save us from error, O Devi. Salutation be to you, Devi Durga. 
May this benign countenance of yours, adorned with three eyes, protect us from all fears. Salutation be to you, O Kata, Katyayani. Salutation terrible with flames, exceedingly sharp, destroying of all shores. May your trident guide guard us from fear. Salutation be to you, O Badra Kali. May your bells fill the world with its ringing and destroy the prowess of the Daitas. Guard us, O Devi, as a mother protects her children from all evils. May your swords mirrored with the mire like blood and fat of Asuras and gleaming with rays be our welfare. O Kandika, we bow to you. When satisfied, you destroy all illness, but when wrathful, you frustrate all long for desires. No calamity befalls man who have sought you. Those who have sought you become verily a refuge of others. This slaughter that you, O Devi, multiply your own form into many, have now wrought on the great assurers who hate righteousness. O Ambika, which other goddesses can do that work? Who is there except you in the sciences, in the scriptures, in the Vedic sayings that light the lamp of discrimination? Still, you cause this universe to whirl about again and again with the dense darkness of the depths of attachment where roxasas and snakes of virulent poison are where foes and hosts of robbers exist, where forest conflagrations occur. There and in the mid-sea, you stand and save the world. O queen of the universe, you protect the universe. As a self of the universe, you support the universe. You are the goddess worthy to be adored by the Lord of the universe. Those who bow in devotion to you themselves become the refuge of the universe. O Devi, be pleased and protect us always from the fears of woe, as you have done just now by the slaughter of Asuras, and destroy quickly the sins of all the worlds and the great calamities which have sprung from the maturing of evil portents. O Devi, you who remove the afflictions of the universe, be gracious to us who have bowed to you. O you worthy of adoration by the dwellers of the three worlds, be boon giver to the worlds. The Devi said, O Devas, I am prepared to bestow a boon. Choose whatever boon you desire in your mind for the welfare of the world. I shall grant it. The Deva said, O queen of all, in the same manner, you must destroy all our enemies and all the afflictions of the three worlds. The Devi said, when the 28th age has arrived during the period of the Vi Vaivasvata Manu, two other great assurers, Sumba and nu Sumba, will be born. Then born from the womb of Yasoda in the home of Cowherd Nanda and the dwelling of the Vindu Mountains, I will destroy them both. And again, having incarnated it, in a very terrible form on the earth, I shall slay the Danavas, who are the descendants of Vipraxiti. And when I shall devour the fierce and great Ashuras descending from Vibra City, my teeth shall become red like the flower of pomegranate. Therefore, when devas in heaven and men on earth praise me, shall always talk of me as the red tooth. And again, when the rain shall fail for a period of hundred years, propitiated by the moon by the moonies i shall be born on the drought ridden earth but not womb begotten then i shall behold the moonies with a hundred eyes and so mankind shall glorify me as the hundred eyes at that time o devas i shall maintain the whole world with life-sustaining vegetables born out of my own cosmic body till rain sets in i shall be famed on earth then as the sakam body at that very period, I shall slay the greatest Sura named Durgama. There I shall be have the celebrated name of Durga Devi. And again, assuming a terrible form on the mountain Himalaya, I shall destroy the Rakasas for the protection of the Munis. Then all the Munis, bowing their heads reverently, shall praise me, and thereby I shall have the celebrated name of Bhima Devi. When the Asura named Aruna shall work, great havoc in the three worlds, having taken a collective bee form consisting in, of innumerable bees, I shall slay the great Ashura for the good of the world. And then people shall laud me everywhere as Brahmadi. Thus, when trouble arises due to the advent of the Danavas, I shall incarnate and destroy the foes. Mm. The Devi said, and that ends the chapter called Hymn to the Narayani. The Devi said, 
And whoever with a concentrated mind shall pray to me constantly with these hymns, I shall without doubt put down every trouble of his. And those who shall laud the story of the destruction of the Madu and Kaitaiba, the slaughter of the Ma Mahiasura and the slaying of Sumba and Sumba likewise, and those who also shall listen with devotion to the sublime poem on my greatness on the 8th and 14th and on the ninth nights of the fortnight, with concentrated mind, to them nothing wrong shall happen, nor calamities that arise with wrongdoings, nor poverty and never separation from beloved ones. He shall not experience fear from enemies or from robbers and kings or from weapon, fire, and flood. Hence, this poem of my greatness must be chanted by men of concentrated minds and listened to always with devotion, for it is the supreme course of well-being. May this poem of my glories quell with all epic calamities, also the threefold nature, natural calamities. The place of my sanctuary where this poem is duly chanted every day, I will never forsake, and there my presence is certain. When sacrifice is offered during worship in the fire ceremony and at a great festival, all this poem on my acts must be chanted and heard. I will accept with love the sacrifice and worship that are made in the fire offering that is offered likewise, whether they are done with due knowledge of sacrifice or not. During autumnal season, when the great annual worship is performed, the man hearing this glorification of my devotion shall certainly, through my grace, be delivered without doubt from all troubles and be blessed with riches, grains, and children. Hearing this glorification and auspicious appearances of mine and my feats of prowess in battles, in battles a man becomes fearless. Enemies perish, welfare accrues, and the family rejoices for those who listen to this glorification of mine. Let one listen to this glorification of mine everywhere, at a proprietary ceremony, on seeing a bad dream, and when there is a great evil influence of the influence of the planets of planets. By that means, evil potent subside, and also the unfavorable influence of planets and the bad dream seen by men turns into a good dream. It creates peacefulness in children possessed by the seasons of children and evil spirits. It is the best promoter of friendship among men when split occurs in their union, diminishes most effectively the power of all men of evil ways. Verily, demons, goblins, and ogres are destroyed by its mere chanting. This entire glorification of mine draws a devotee very near to me and by means of finest cattle flowers arga and incenses by perfumes and lamps by feeding the brahmanas by oblations by sprinkling consecrated water by various other offerings and gifts if one worships day and night in a year the gratification which is done to me is attained by listening but once to this holy story of mine the chanting and hearing of this story of my manifestations removes sins grants perfect health and protects one from evil spirits and when my martial exploit in the form of the slaughter of the wicked deities are listened to men will have no fear from enemies and the hymns uttered by you and those by the divine sages and those by brahmi bestow a pious mind he who is lost on a lonesome spot in a forest or is surrounded by forest fire or who is surrounded by robbers of a desolate spot or who is captured by enemies or who is pursued by a lion or a tiger or by wild, wild elephants in a forest or who under the orders of a wrathful king is sentenced to death or who has been imprisoned or who is tossed about in his boat by a tempest in the vast sea or who is in the most terrible battle under shower of weapons or who is amidst all kinds of dreadful troubles or who is afflicted with pain with pain such a man on remembering this story of mine is saved from his strait through my power lions etc robbers and enemies flee from a distance from him who remembers the story of mine in times of prosperity, she is indeed Lakshmi, who bestows prosperity. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I skipped some. Oops. The Rishi said, having spoken this adorable Kandika, fierce in prowess, vanished on that very spot, even as the Devas were gazing on. Their foes having been killed, all the Devas were also delivered from fear. All of them resumed their own duties as before and participated in their share of sacrifices. When the exceedingly valor <clears throat> valorous Sumba and Sumba, the most fierce foes of Devas, who brought ruin on the world and who were unparalleled in, pro 
prowess had been slain by the Devi in battle. The remaining deities went away to Patala. <clears throat> Thus, O king, the adorable Devi, although eternal, incarnating again and again, protects the world. By her, this universe is deluded. It is she who creates this universe. When she, when entreated, she bestows supreme knowledge. When pro propitiated, she bestows prosperity. By her, the Mahakali, who takes form of the great destroyer at the end of time, all this cosmic sphere is pervaded. She takes the form of the great destroyer at the proper time. She, the unborn, indeed becomes this creation at the time proper for recreation. She, recreation. She herself, the eternal being, sustains the beings at another time. In times of prosperity, she is indeed Lakshmi. She bestows prosperity in the homes of men and in the times of misfortune. She herself becomes the goddess of misfortune who brings about ruin. When praised and worshiped with flowers, incense, and perfumes, etc., she bestows wealth and sons and a mind bent on righteousness and prosperous life. Here ends a chapter called Eulogy of the Merits. The Rishi said, I now have narrated to you, O King, the sublime poem on the glory of the Devi. The Devi is endowed with such majestic power. By her, this world is upheld. Knowledge is similarly conferred by her, the elusive power of Bhagavan Vishnu. By her, you, this merchant and other men of discrimination are being deluded and others were deluded in the past and will be deluded in the future. O oh, great king, take refuge in her, the supreme Isvati. She indeed, when worship, bestows on men enjoyment, heaven, and final release from transmigration. Markandeya said to his disciple Baguri, O oh, great sage, King Suratha, who has become despondent consequent on his excessive attachment and the deprivation of his kingdom, and the merchant having heard this speech prostrated before the illustrious Rishi of severe penances and immediately prepared to perform austerities. Both king and the merchant, in order to obtain a vision of Amba, stationed themselves on the sand bank of a river and practiced penances, chanting the supreme, the supreme Devi Sukta, hymn to the Devi. Having made an earthen image of the Devi on the sands of the river, they both worship her with flowers, incense, fire, libation of water. Now, abstaining from food and now restraining in their food, with their mind on her and with concentration, they both offered sacrifices sprinkled with blood drawn from their own bodies. When they, controlled with controlled minds, propitiated her thus for three years, Kandika, the upholder of the world, was well pleased and spoke to them in visible form. The Devi said, what you solicit, O king, and you, the delight of your family, received all that from me. Well pleased, I bestow those to you both. Markadania said, then the king chose a kingdom imperishable even in another life and in this life itself his own kingdom wherein the power of his enemies is destroyed by force then the wise merchant also whose mind was full of dispassion for the world chose that knowledge which removes the attachment of mind and eye the devi said o king after slaying your foes in a few days you shall obtain your own kingdom and it shall last with you there and when you are dead and you shall gain another birth from the Deva Vivasvat, the sun, and shall be a Manu on earth by the name Savarni. And, oh, the best of merchants, I grant you the boon which you have desired from me. Knowledge shall be yours for your self-realization. Markandeya said, having thus granted them both the boon that each desired, the Devi disappeared forthwith. And as they were extolling with her, extolling her with devotion, having thus gained the boon from the Devi, Suratha, the foremost of the Khatriya, shall obtain a new birth through Surya and of his wife Savarna, and shall be the Manu eighth named Savarni. Shall be the Manu named Savarni. Here ends the thirteenth chapter called the bestowing of boons to Suratha and Vaisya of the Devi Mahatmyam. And here ends the Devi Mahatmyam of the 700 Matras. Om Tat Sat Om.